Hello, hello, and welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. For those of you new to the show, I welcome you. I am your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and for those returning, welcome back. So glad you're here. Either way, we are in our cult series right now. We're just in our second week. I feel like I've been in it for months, which now that I'm saying it out loud is interesting and making me feel strange. Uh, But it's because I've been having the interviews for a while and some of them have been very long and some have inspired a lot of reading. So I'm in a very cultic place in my thinking and I'm just really, really loving the series. Although it's come to my attention that um, my husband thinks I know a lot more about Nexium than any woman who is not in Nexium should. But uh, we'll just keep that between us, okay? So we're going to continue on the expert path this week in the series, and I'm really grateful for that because I think there's just so much to understand, so much groundwork needed, that it's a really good foundation for the next two episodes, which will be survivor stories. So I'm really excited to introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Yanya Lalich. She is a sociologist, a former professor, she is retired, of sociology and a cult expert. Additionally, similarly to my last guest, has a personal experience with cults that pretty much propelled her into this work and informs much of her thinking and passion around the topic. So I find that really interesting that both expert guests have a very personal connection to the topic that's really informed their work. So I'm really grateful for Dr. Lalich for her time, and she was just a wonderful perspective on how a rational, intelligent, politically-minded person with hopes to impact the future positively can fall prey to the grips of cults, and not just the leader, but the group think in the organization. And that's a really important distinction she makes, that it's not always coming from the super top to be top leader, right? It's it's the next in command. Those people's influence is so, so strong. So we're going to talk about what she does now, how she's helping people who are finding their way out of cults. And we're going to get into more about Nexium and QAnon because they are right now very pressing cult topics in the news and in society. And uh, just like Rick Allen Ross was, Dr. Lalich is concerned deeply. So it's worth exploring. You will also hear what is keeping her up at night and also how being in a cult for 10 years has impacted her even to this day on a personal level. So again, I'm really grateful for her time. She's highly sought after right now. People are calling her for advice on where to get a therapist to help them in their post-cult recovery. They're calling for her to speak about Nexium and QAnon. And that is why I'm just so glad I got the FaceTime with her. She's a wonderful woman and an amazing professional and sociologist. And I appreciate her insight so much. So without further ado, let's get right into the episode. This is part two in our four-week series on cults. And again, the next two weeks, we're going to be hearing from former members themselves, which I'm also really excited about because that's going to be how we humanize all of this and put faces to this, this theme, right? This abstract idea that sometimes feels impossible to understand. So thank you, Dr. Yanya Lalich. Thank you, listeners. Please share this podcast. If you are enjoying it, please rate and review as well and follow along on social media. I'm very active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. It's at Dialogue Pod. That's D-I-E-A-L-O-G-U-E pod. And we can continue the conversation there. But for now, it is time to kill the small talk. I am so excited to welcome another cult expert to our series on cults. Dr. Yanya Lalich is here. And uh, Dr. Yan- Dr. Lalich, whoo, thank you so much for being on with me today. No, oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. If we can get through me saying your name, I think we're going to get through all these cult questions. <laughs> That's always the trick at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I think once I've said it right, we'll be okay. Right. Um, so I'm really excited to have you because I'm doing this four-week series on cults. And the first two episodes are going to be speaking with two experts, yourself being one. And then we're going to hear from survivors themselves. That's great. Because I think that's really important, too, to hear their personal, you know, to, to humanize the story. But you get to do both for us in a way, right? Because you started out and found yourself, unfortunately, in a a cult grip. And now it sort of informs so much of your work. So maybe we could start with the beginning of your story. Okay. Uh, Well, um, 
when I was 30 years old, I moved to San Francisco. I had been living in Europe for about four years. So I was kind of new in San Francisco, um, making new friends. Um, I'd already been to college. I had my BA from University of Wisconsin. Um, and my, my hope was to be a writer. And so I was kind of doing part-time jobs enough to survive. And I met a woman who, um, and this was right at the end of the Vietnam War. And so a lot of people on the left were kind of trying to figure out what do we do now. And I met a woman who uh, was a friend of, of, of a former roommate and we would run into each other on the street and have coffees. And she eventually asked me to join a study group, uh, which were, were, these were very common at that time. And um, so I joined because I thought, oh, I'll meet some new people. It'll be a good opportunity. I didn't know that the study group was a front for this uh, you know, organization in the background. Um, so after a few weeks in the study group, um, she and another woman from the group met with me and, um, and <laughs> it's so hard to explain. The purpose of the study group basically was to, we, we read a lot of various uh, revolutionary leaders. And the purpose of the study group was to get you to see that you needed a certain type of political organization in order to make real change. Okay. Um, and I was interested in, you know, helping create a better society. Uh, so at, about halfway through the study group, they met with me and, and said, um, well, you know, what if we told you we have an organization like that? And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, really? So uh, a few more, jumping through a few more hoops, I then joined. Uh, I didn't really know what I was joining. It didn't even have a name at that time. But I joined this political organization that was um, basically founded and led by women. And I was a feminist also at that time, you know, sort of learning all about that. This is in the mid 70s. And, um, and that was it. And before I knew it, I was in this very restrictive group. Um, we had to take on new names. We worked 20 hours a day, seven days a week. We um, had all kinds of front groups for recruiting. Um, we spent a lot of time criticizing each other, like just sitting in a circle, tearing somebody apart, uh, which was supposed to be the way to get rid you of your bourgeois characteristics from wow. growing up in regular society. Anyway, it, it was, um, was not a happy experience. Uh, it, and we were told, you know, no one said this would be fun. You know, this is, you're going to be disciplined you know, fighters for the revolution, you know, of course, this is going to be hard to go through this training. So you couldn't complain, you know, once they told you that. Anyway, uh, so I was in that group for about 10 and a half years. And um, unlike most groups, our, our group actually imploded. And at the end, we um, expelled our leader and dissolved the organization by unanimous vote of the members. Uh, so it was a very unusual ending. Uh, so I was about 41 when I got out. Um, I moved to New York. Um, my brain was scrambled. I couldn't even read like the front page of a newspaper without going, nah, you know, just like couldn't focus. I, I did get a job. Um, so I was working. And then at night I would try to write about my experience and I would just sit at the computer. Well, they were word processors back then, but I would just sit at the word processor and cry and try to figure out what had happened to me. And Fortunately, I got into therapy and New York at the time had a cult clinic where the therapist, oh. yeah, which was wonderful. And the therapist specialized in, uh, you know, post-cult after effects. Um, so I found a wonderful therapist who really saved my life. Um, after a few years, I moved back to the Bay Area and then I eventually um, applied to graduate school. So I didn't start graduate school for my PhD until I was 50. Um, yeah, so a little bit of a late bloomer there, but, um, but even before then I had written a couple of books. I was working with families and former cult members and, and doing speaking engagements and presentations and, um, yeah, so that's how I got into it. And then, you know, once I got out of grad school, I became a sociology professor at one of the state universities here in California, um, and continued with my research and writing and couldn't work with people as much while I had a full teaching load. But now that I'm retired, I'm kind of back to, um, I've been doing some Zoom workshops with former cult members and uh, things like that. And a lot of interviews with people like you, you know, trying to educate the public. 
So, well, thank you for that. Wow. So do you want to name that organization? Because I know what it was that you were a part of. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, it's no problem. The the background name uh, was the Democratic Workers Party. And we were, of course, the farthest thing from democratic. Um, It was, you know, it was a communist organization. We were Marxist Leninists and uh, very strict. And then we had all kinds of front groups like the Rebel Worker Organization, the Grassroots Alliance. Each front group was geared towards a particular population that we wanted to recruit. Wow. So what was your moment where the realization that it was a cult and not just a strict organization or a weird organization or an unusual one happened? Was it in therapy or was it at the time that it all fell apart? Well, it was before that. I, I first of all, um, about, I guess... Well, it was 1981, so I'd been in for six years at that time or something like that. And, um, and then a, a, whole scenario, a whole series of events happened that revolved around the death of my mother. And, um, and that was very difficult for me. And, and the cult's position was, um, you know, well, you're not going to go to your mother's funeral. And, and that just like, I mean, I remember looking at the phone when my leadership said that and thinking, you know, here I am killing myself to build a better world. And they're telling me I can't go to my mother's funeral, but, you know, so I kind of snapped at that point, but I couldn't leave. I couldn't figure out how to leave. Um, I just felt absolutely psychologically trapped. Um, I had nobody on the outside anymore, no friends, no contacts. Both my parents were dead at that point. And I just kind of hunkered down and kept at it and just, literally every day I'd get in my car and I would wish that I'd be killed in a car accident because it was the only way I could see to get out. So that went on for another four or five years. I just lived in misery and sort of, you know, rotely did my work. And, and then when the end came, all, all kinds of incidents happened that uh, one of my comrades and I were on our, on our way to a book fair at, at Frankfurt because I ran the publishing house for the cult. And uh, things, things were really, really pretty crazy by then. Everybody was strung out. You know, most of the members had been in for the full 10 years and just exhausted and stressed. And so anyway, he and I got on the plane and as soon as they shut the door of the plane, we looked at each other and said, we're in a cult and just started crying and um, talked about, sort of planned an escape. And what happened was at that same time, our comrades back home were going through similar things. So when I got back from Europe, um, we called together all the members and basically told them what really went on behind the scenes and that the leader was an alcoholic and she was a narcissist and, you know, everything was fake. And, and, you know, it was difficult because people didn't want to believe us. It was like, you know, we're ripping the rug out from, they had no clue. You know, we in the inner circle knew the madness of being around the leader, but some of the members never even met her or saw her. Mm. It took three days to convince people of what we were telling them. And um, yeah, so, so the realization that it was a cult, um, it took some time. I mean, I, I wasn't even really familiar with the word really. I mean, I, I was so, even though we were in San Francisco in an urban area at times I was in New York, you know, we never had time to read the newspaper or watch the news, you know, so you're, comp- you're in the world, but you're completely shut into this little bubble. Yeah, really isolated. Um, may I ask if you if you made the decision to go to your mom's funeral? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, oh, I did. I'm so glad to hear that. It, it was the first time that I really defied the organization. Wow. And, and I flew home. I borrowed money and I flew back to Milwaukee for the funeral. And I was freaked out the whole time because I knew when I got back, they were going to slaughter me. And um, I have very few memories even of the funeral and of the big dinner afterwards that we had because I was just so freaked out. And I never, you know, I never really was able to grieve my mother's death and, until after I got out. And in many ways, I'm still grieving her death, you know, because sure. it was so traumatic. Um, she actually died in my house. And um, that's a whole other story. But so, yeah, the, I mean, these are the kinds of things that happen in these groups that seem unbelievable that people think, you know, well, why did she go along with that? And, you know, it's sometimes hard to explain unless you've been there, but the, that, that psychological trap is really tight. Yeah, the grip, you can just, you can hear it and everything you're saying, and I can imagine it 
when you when you give the context around it. I always think it's interesting because I think what we're starting to understand as lay people who have no involvement in cults is that there is some confluence of personal events maybe that could make someone vulnerable, right? You had mentioned sort of a transitional time in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also think you as a sociologist must look at the lens of society and culture too. Does do you, how much does that impact a cult's moment, right? Like what's going on in the world? Oh, I mean, the absolutely. 1970s and feminism post Vietnam, like that sounds rife for right. a school of thought to become cultic. Right. right. So, and you know, the other cult that formed at that time, uh, you know, many others, but one of the ones, um, this is actually what I did for my dissertation. I did a comparative study of the cult I was in and the Heaven's Gate cult, which yes. people might remember was the group that uh, committed mass suicide um, yeah. in, in 1997. Well, that group started exactly the same year our group started, but it was a different part of the sociocultural atmosphere at that time. It was the people who were talking about UFOs and getting into new age thinking and exploring other, you know, other mediums and other ways of having consciousness. So, you know, it's just very interesting. These two completely different types of groups from different segments of the society, in a sense, uh, started at the same time. And, and of course, that group had a, a completely opposite ending from ours, uh, tragically. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the survivors I'll be speaking to. Uh, huh will be Heaven's Gate. So I did note that you have done extensive research on that and uh, use it, I think, as a case study in your book, which I would like to talk about because there's some interesting terminology that you prefer and I think would be helpful for us to talk about. So brainwashing, right? We use that word so casually, so flippantly, and you have a a term that you prefer, uh, bounded choice, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So first, let me say brainwashing has become kind of a buzzword and has been uh, very maligned in many ways by uh, certain academics who tend to defend the cults and go to court to defend them and things like that. So that they've tried to make it seem like brain, this whole idea of brainwashing is pseudoscience. You know, there's nothing real to it. That's absolutely not true. Uh, What brainwashing really is, is um, a very deep re-socialization, right? When when we think about as a person, when we join a company, we get socialized into the norms of that company, right? If we join the military, we get socialized into being a soldier, right? So what happens in these groups is you get socialized or re-socialized, if you're already an adult, into the ideology and the belief system and the the loyalty and the worship of the leader, right? So th- there's nothing phony about it. And it does change who you are. It changes your moral values. I use the term bounded choice to try to explain, um, you know, I wrote that book, which is called Bounded Choice, to try to explain to people on the outside who who absolutely can't fathom the things that happen in cults, you know, parents giving away their children or people committing suicide or murders or just being completely sequestered and cutting off from birth families, you know, all of those things. People, people don't, they say, how could they do that? How could they do that? So what I tried to show through my bounded choice framework and theory is that what happens is you, you, as you become more and more indoctrinated, you become enveloped into this, what I call a self-sealing system. The group kind of closes in on you and the group is closed in on itself. And you only have access to what the group or the leader wants you to have access to, right? You don't entertain other ways of thinking, right? So that that bounded reality essentially closes your mind uh, to anything that goes against what you've been led to believe in. And so bounded choice is a way of um, understanding this whole concept of free will. Because people say, well, you know, you had free will. Why didn't you leave? Nobody was holding a gun to your head. Well, in, in cults, when you're trapped in a cult, your free will is constrained, right, by the will of the group so that your free will is actually altered. And in a sense, it's no longer yours. And so the bounded choice, what I mean by that is that, yes, you have choices. In most groups, people aren't telling you exactly everything to do every minute of the day. 
but your choices, you know exactly the decision you need to make to stay in the good graces of that group and, and reach whatever salvation you're being promised. So does that okay. make sense? It does make sense. And I would imagine it varies as much as people vary from one another, but how long does that typically take for someone to have that kind of buy-in to where whatever um, self propelled thoughts they have are now kind of minimized and drowned out by the groups. Right. How, like on average, is there one? I, you know, it really varies. It depends on how good the cult is at what they do, you know, the, the trainers and the recruiters. Uh, it depends on uh, how deeply, how quickly and deeply you get involved. You know, some people kind of stay on the perimeter for quite a while. Um, you know, not every group all lives together, like we certainly didn't. Um, whereas if you join a group that's sequestered and you're off somewhere with them, like the Heaven's Gate group was, you're more likely to get indoctrinated faster because there's nothing else to reach out to, right? Right. Um, so, so it really varies. I mean, when the Unification Church, you know, commonly known as the Moonies, were recruiting back in the 80s, I mean, they were considered the masters at it. I mean, they could get someone absolutely dedicated within a week um and they took but they mostly took them off to a camp in northern california and they couldn't leave the bus that took them there left and so they were kind of in this environment where yeah they played volleyball or whatever it was they played some kind of ball oh why is it always volleyball that's I don't what know. I did too. Know. <laughs> um, but you know it was 24 hours a day they were watched and monitored and someone was always at their side and so they they very quickly would succumb to the to the pressures, the influences, and the controls. So, wow. um, so it does really vary with the individual. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's define cult. Uh, it's defined a few ways. How how would you define it? Well, for me, a cult first of all has to have the authoritarian quote charismatic leader, and that that's the person who starts the group, who comes up with. Uh, whatever the idea is, this is this promise of salvation, whether it's political or religious or losing weight or earning mm -hmm. money, whatever it might be, right? Whatever the draw is. Uh, so there has to be that, that, that charismatic leader who is authoritarian in nature, right? Um, and then secondly, there needs to be what I call um, a transcendent belief system, a belief system that offers you the answers to everything, to the past, the present, and the future. And part of that belief system is that you have to transform yourself. And that's very key because that's where the indoctrination comes in. Right. And, then, and then thirdly, there, there, need to, there needs to be a structure of what I call uh, influence, systems of influence and systems of control that work together to uh, reinforce everything that you're learning. You know, such, you know, the, the very overt rules, like maybe how you're supposed to dress or how many children you're supposed to have or not have, but also the more subtle influences, the modeling of the older members, the peer pressure, things like that. So you put all of that together and, and you've got a group that um, becomes very closed and where there can only be loyalty to the leader. Got it. That all resonates with what I knew and um, expands it a little bit. So would you agree that a lot of times what cult leaders are promising is quite attractive or appealing to some yeah. universal uh, desire in a lot of us? Yes. They appeal yes. to seekers and something bigger and better than yourself and answers to where sometimes yeah. there really are no answers, but they're promising them. So right. I mean, is that I, accurate? Yes. I mean, pe sometimes people say, oh, well, the people who join are seekers as though that's some kind of derogatory label. I mean, the reality is I think we're all seekers, right? I agree a hundred percent. I mean, we, we all need to have some kind of framework for understanding the world. Uh, most of us want to belong to something we want to contribute in a way. Um, and so, you know, what I've noticed and uh, over the years is, it, you know, if there's any common denominator, uh, among people who join these groups, it's idealism, right? Mm. It's people who want to make a better world. And so that our idealism is one of our strengths, but in a sense, it's also our weakness because that's what cults are targeting. That's what that's who the cult recruiters are looking for. So it's not weak-willed, weak-minded people. I mean, cults want A-type personalities. They want people who can perform for them, who can run the businesses, who can recruit, who can bring in, um, you know, contacts and celebrities to lend legitimacy. 
you know, they don't want people who are going to sit around and do nothing and complain. <laughs> but uh, what you're saying is also true. The message has to resonate with you, right? So I always say I never would have joined a meditation cult because I can't sit still that long. Mm. But a political cult, oh boy, that was for me. I mean, not that I knew it was a cult, but that message was for me. Yes, let's create a better world. Um, so the, whatever the message is has to somehow resonate with you for you to take that first step. Yeah. So for cult leaders, it's knowing your audience, right? You probably yes. strategically go after a certain type of person. Uh, that makes so much sense. And I think we're let seeing me, that. Uh, let me just clarify. It, it, it's not really the leaders who do the recruiting. It's the, it's, it's the leaders, usually their lieutenants and next levels down get trained as recruiters. The leaders are the ones who are lazy in most parts. They're the ones who sit back and get waited on and don't do very much. Um, I'm but, glad you said that. But it's everyone else who goes out and does the recruiting. And most of the recruiting, at least initially, is done through friendship networks. Um, right. You, and those are people you trust, you know, asking you to come to something or, you know, whatever it might be. And of course, today, a lot of it is in the business world. There are so many of these um, leadership training courses, management courses that are extremely cultic. And some of them actually are cults, uh, certainly in the top rungs. And so in many ways today, uh, the cults have mainstreamed and they're actually recruiting uh, older people rather than kids in college. I mean, some recruits are still focusing on college age kids, but most cults are looking for people in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, because, wow. these, because these are people who are educated, they have jobs, they're skilled, they have things that can tr contribute to the cult, right? And in most cases, they don't have a parent who's going to come after them and try to get them out, right? It's Good like, point. well, you know, he's 35, he's doing what he wants to do, right? So, you know, most of the calls that I get these days are about people that age and not about college age kids. Wow. So in that scenario, the business side, are you referring to sort of like multi-level marketing companies? Well, multi-level marketing companies are one aspect of that. And, and not all MLMs are cults. Sure. Some are, um, which I will not name, but some are. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's the multi-level marketing ones, but there's also the, um, you know, these mass marathon leadership training things, you know, where they take you off to a ballroom for a, a hotel somewhere for three or five days and you're walking on hot coals and you're, you know, you're doing all this right. kind of crazy stuff. And so many businesses today send their employees to these types of trainings, um, not realizing the, the dangers in, the, in them because they use the same type of kind of mind altering techniques that shut down your critical thinking. And they're trying to get you to come back again, come back again, come back again. So when you go to something, you know, they, and even though they're often quite brutal and, um, and uh, harmful in the kind of disclosures you're expected to make, they always ended on a high. So when mm. you leave, you think, oh, that was the greatest thing. I've got to bring everybody I know to it. And then, you know, the high starts to wear off. So that's when you sign up for another course you know, and, and that's what they want you to do. That's really interesting. Uh, one thing I've learned about cults is there's destructive cults. You want to look for the destructive, the destruction that a cult leaves in its wake versus a benign cult. It can still be a cult, but maybe it's not doing the kind of damage that another one is. So what you were just describing, where would that be on the spectrum of benign to destructive? Well, I suppose they're kind of in the middle, you know, except for the ones that, that you know, really keep trying to recruit you up into the ranks. Okay. In, my, in my, I mean, I, I do believe cults exist on a spectrum from harmful to less harmful. In a way, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot. In a way, I don't think any of them are completely benign because what a cult is about is, is essentially owning your mind. Mm. You're, giving, you're giving up your sense of self, your individuality, you're giving up your um, your ability to question and and manage your own life. Um, so even in the more benign groups, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's ever good to have to to take away some someone's sense of self and and loss of self esteem and self confidence and gear it toward you know some other belief system. Um, so yeah, there are more benign groups, like, you know, in the sense that they're not causing harm to any anything on the outside and and they're not completely, you know, traumatically harmful to the people in the group. But um, 
find, I don't find too many of those. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like it. And it is a dangerous beginning, even if it's just a beginning for someone to, to lose that autonomy and self-will, right? Because who knows exactly. where that could go. Exactly. Announcing Mind Over Murder, a new true crime podcast. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Join us each week as we explore new true crime cases, as well as introduce you to experts from a variety of fields in the true crime space. You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. Available on your favorite podcast platform. I read that you list money, sex, and power as the driving forces for cult leaders. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have to have all three to be considered? Okay. So some are really motivated by different things. Right. Exactly. I mean, power is always there, obviously. Right. Uh, And and that kind of self-indulgence. I mean, they're all narcissistic, the cult leaders. And then, and then the, the ones who are into money, you know, for example, Bhagwan Rajneesh, who was the cult leader in Oregon, right? The guy had 93 Rolls Royces. I mean, you know, who needs 93? And then every day he'd drive down the road in one of his Rolls Royces and everyone had to stand and throw roses at him, you know? So for him, it was that kind of materialistic display. Um, you know, for some other cult leader, you know, uh, like there was a political cult, a small political cult in New York where the leader literally his bedroom was like his room was like a closet in the Mm -hmm. the brownstone building they lived in but he got to have sex with whatever women he wanted to you know so for him it was that combination he was able to control a group of about 50 people and he was able to have sex with whoever he wanted and so that was his kick Uh, so so there's there's usually some combination of that okay and how about gender breakdown in terms of leaders and uh, members. I I feel like we hear a lot more about male cult leaders, Mm -hmm. but I actually did an event last year with an author and we we called it female persuasion and we covered female cult leaders and there are more than people would think, but they're obscure. And we, it's just interesting, of course, right? The patriarchy, like we don't even hear about them. Like (laughs) they, they, they did some damage, some of them, but um, so statistically, what's the breakdown give or take for leaders and also members? Is it pretty equal between men and women joining mm-hmm. cults? Yes. Uh, for leaders, I would say it's probably 75, 25. Okay. That 75 sounds... being male. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we hear more about the male groups in part because they either tend to be flashier or they tend to be more um, violent or criminal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they attract more attention. Um I think the female cult leaders, I mean, there definitely are some very harmful female cult leaders or have been and still are. Um, And you're right, they don't get as much play as or media coverage as the male ones do. Um, As for members, I I pretty much think it's 50-50, maybe 60-40. And again, I think people tend to think it's women who join cults more. Um, because in many ways, women are more vulnerable just b- the way, because of the way we're raised in society uh, to like mm. not challenge and not question and, and not think we're good enough and, you know, gives you all these reasons you might want to join something. Um, but I also think people, when people leave groups, I think the women uh, tend to speak out more about their experiences. And whereas uh, many of the men, at least in, from my experience over the years, and in, and even with the, the group that I was in, many of the men, I think, just kind of crawl back in the woodwork and don't want to talk about it. And that has to do with how men are raised, right? Where they don't talk yeah. about their emotions or their trauma or their whatever. Um, I think happily today, there are more men, um, you know, like I've been running these Zoom workshops, and we've had quite a number of men in the workshop who have been expressing themselves just as heartfelt as the women. And it's been wonderful to see that. Um, 
because they have stories to tell as well. And they, they, they were traumatized equally. Yeah, that is, that's encouraging to hear. Um, what are your calls? Like you're, you're referencing these workshops and that you're really busy right now. So a, what are you doing with, with clients, if you will, and also education? And what do you think it is about this moment that we're in that has raised the awareness around cults? Okay. So what I do, um, I don't do interventions. Okay. Um, and so, uh, but I, I did, you know, I have a website and through that website, people can email me and, um, uh, often it's um, spouses, uh, you know, the husband or the wife have gotten involved with something. Um, so what I, you know, it, and every case is a little different. In some cases, I will talk to the person for a while and really see what the situation is and try to help them maybe come up with a strategy. Um, in most cases, like if they're, if they think they want to do some kind of intervention, then there's a few people I might refer them to, um, or if they're looking for a therapist, I try to find out where they live and see if I can find someone who has uh, a therapist who has some understanding of post cult uh, after effects, which is rare, which is where we need to do a lot of training. Oh, good. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, with former members, again, it depends on where they live. I mean, right now with Zoom, it's wonderful. I mean, we had people in our Zoom workshop from New Zealand, from Scotland, from, you know, all, all around the country. It was wonderful. Um, so with former members, it depends, again, how long they've been out and what group they're in. I might recommend reading. I, you know, again, try to find them a therapist in their area or suggest, you know, these kind. there's several other uh, organizations doing Zoom support groups, things like that. Um, and then I get professional calls. You know, I just recently got a, a, a message from a uh, a therapist here in the Bay Area who wanted to learn more about this. And she saw that we were running these workshops and wanted to know if we were doing similar things for helping professionals. So I, wow. I yeah, so that, and um, so I hear from, I hear from attorneys. I, I do, I have done and do some expert witness work, um, which is tough, but also I really love doing it because I feel like I'm helping bring about justice for someone. Um, so I do that, that kind of work. And then my writing and my speaking. And, you know, as you know, I do a ton of media. And sometimes I pull my hair out and I say, I'm 75 years old. Do I really need to keep doing this? You know? But I, I just feel it's important. You know, I, t I, I sort of took my experience. I always say I turned a bad thing into a good thing. Yeah. And I really feel that it's kind of been my mission, if you want to word it that way, to, to help educate the public about these groups um, and, and also work with victims, but um, much more so I, I see my role as an educator. Um, and that trickles down to the people who've had experiences. But, you know, I've written about six books and, on this subject. And um, so, yeah, so uh, that, that's what I do. Yeah, well, your personal story informs your expertise too, which makes you uniquely suited and um, I'm sure helps with just the way people perceive former cult members, right? Mm -hmm. Just just mm -hmm. to know that it isn't what we used to think, which is that people have no mind of their own and they're exactly. they're silly or, yeah. or stupid I mean, or that, worse. Yeah. I, when I was teaching, I loved it because my students, you know, I would, uh, I mean, the, fine, the word eventually got around campus and I think they all knew. You know, I was the quote cult professor, but <laughs> but they were always so shocked. They're like, "Oh my God, you!" You know, because I, I was a pretty tough professor. You know, and, and yeah, I think I'm kind of a tough dame. So that's um, amazing. They, they would always be so surprised. They're like, "Well, I guess if you can get in one, I better be careful." You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think that's, that's a word to the wise. Absolutely. I don't, I think the minute any of us look at anything like, well, not me, I, I think we're doomed, not doomed, but I, I like to live a little more humbly than that. Like it could be me. Um, but uh, something you said earlier was it's not the leader that's usually doing this active recruiting. And we're really seeing that play out right now with Nexium because of the, the co-defendants to Keith Ranieri. And we just saw Claire Bronfman get an 81 month sentence. So yeah. I'm struggling with it as I look at the women that were powerful in that organization. I'm wondering if they're victims or perpetrators or both, or did they start out as a victim and became the perpetrator? What is the right sentence and all of that stuff. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 
Well, you know, um, it, it's complex. Uh, when people are in leadership uh, of a group, you know, as I was in my group, you end up selling your soul. You know, you end up doing things that hopefully when you get out, you'll screw your head back on the right way and you'll see what you did wrong and you'll acknowledge it and you'll, you know, apologize to people. The, the, the problem with Claire Bronfman is that she absolutely has remained loyal uh, to Keith Ranieri and she has never apologized to the people she hurt. Right. And, and she, she used her millions, her millions and millions of Seagram dollars to um, just terrorize various individuals for years and 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 also threaten you know the other people knew that that was going on so you knew if you left you know they were going to come after you and try to ruin your life and so she may not have like directly been as influential as say nancy salzman who was really one of the key trainers um you know claire didn't have that role but her money you know was her sword and um and it's, 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 to me, it's just tragic that she hasn't yet, you know, cop to it. And I, I, I almost felt like her sentence was too light. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I hate saying that, but, you know, and then you have, you know, you have someone like Lauren Salsman who on the stand, you know, I mean, Lauren Salsman really understood what the hell was wrong and, um, and was able to acknowledge that. And, and you've got other former members who've come out who, yes, they're victims, but many of them all, you know, in a cult, almost everyone ends up being a perpetrator at some mm. level, right? Because you're, you're all reporting on each other, chastising each other, holding each other accountable to the norms, you know, whatever it might be in any group. So, um, you know, the, the people who get targeted, you know, and then I think, you know, there are going to be people who get in a group who weren't the leader, but who become kind of, you know, who emulate the leader and become almost like them, who maybe themselves have some psychopathic tendencies. Oh, and interesting. Are, and are also mean. I mean, I, I can think of one in my group that was like that. You okay. know, so yeah, in a sense, those people are victims in, you know, if they had never gotten recruited and joined that group, would they have ended up being so mean to people? Um, you know, we don't know. But certainly in that context, it was kind of like they blossomed, you know. So not everybody is is free and clear of, um, of what, am I, what, what do I want to say? Free and clear of uh, if inflicting damage on other people. Yeah. Uh, even though they had damage also inflicted on them. I think it depends what you do with it it depends what you do with it once you get out. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And I mean, for Lauren Salzman, she was very young, mm -hmm. her, you know, almost like an older adolescent. So I, I feel particularly compassionate towards her mm -hmm. having almost been raised in a, at a pivotal age. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm very curious about Nancy Salzman and Allison Max sentencing. I'll be really curious to see what yeah. they see. The predictions for Keith do not look good. I don't think no. he's going to come out. No. no, he's not. Thank God. Yeah. Um, uh, and and Alice and Mac, we don't really know much about. I mean, I know I, it's been very quiet. I I you know, uh, just the other day I asked you know someone who's down in the in the L.A. area if anybody heard anything about Allison, but not, there's hasn't been any peep about her in a long time. Um, Nancy Salzman, uh, she deserves a, a pretty good sentence, I'd say. I mean, yeah, it's interesting because of all the former members from that group that I've met, which are many, mm. um, no one had anything nice to say about Nancy Salzman. Yikes. Uh, nor Claire, nor did they have anything nice to say about Claire. And people were somewhat convict conflicted uh, about Allison. Um, but Allison obviously became a true believer uh, deeply, deeply. Um, and, you know, one of the great recovery stories is, is India Oxenberg. Yeah. And, you know, that one really touches my heart because I, I worked with her mom somewhat. And Did you? Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I've, you know, and I've, you know, just recently met India and, you know, she's doing a fantastic job recovering and getting, you know, sort of getting her voice back. And um, so glad to hear that. Yeah. I know a lot of us watching The Vow, you know, Catherine's storyline is so tough to watch, you know, mm -hmm. her go through that, having been in it herself and bringing India in and then disconnecting right. from her. And 
I, I, I can't imagine how difficult it was for her to make some of the yeah. decisions she had to make to, yeah. to save her daughter. As a mom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so my last guest believes that this QAnon stuff is cultic and dangerous. And I agree. But what we don't know who Q is, right? So does the totalian leader apply here? I mean, it's clearly there's not a real one real person, I don't think. I mean, maybe, but it's so uh, bizarre. I, I, I thought they did discover who it is. Oh, please, if you know. No, I don't. Enlighten I mean, me. No, I don't. I mean, I, you know, I should write things down more, but um, I thought I read an art, but where they unearthed him. But maybe I'm thinking of the Citibank guy. Um, oh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I try to keep up on QAnon, but right. it's really possible I missed something. Well, and I mean, whoever your last guest was, I don't know, but I absolutely agree that QAnon is is cultic and it's dangerous, and okay. it's and it's dangerous not only because the beliefs are so wacky, um, but it's dangerous because it's it's um, encouraging people to act out, you know, to act out against the outside world. Which, right. which which most cults don't do. Um, they're they're more insular, and if they're violent, they're usually violent to their own members. Um, Interesting. So, so the fact that they're um, you know sending you know people are going off to protests, and you know people are accusing you know people of you know these heinous crimes that are just ludicrous, and you know I mean the PizzaGate one I think was a precursor to QAnon where mm -hmm. you know this guy with a gun walks into this pizza place looking for you know Hillary's pedophile ring I mean it's just insane so um and I think also QAnon's dangerous because it has such support at high levels of our government um and um you know kind of silent nods and I think that's you know that lends it a kind of legitimacy and it's recruiting so fast and so so widely. I mean, there's now, you know, there've been demonstrations in Germany and in Australia, other countries. I mean, it's just like wildfire. Yeah. It seems to be feeding and breeding uh, on the pandemic and social media seem right. to be like incubating this and just, it's explosive, the growth. Right. Um, and I, you know, and that, that uh, lends to your second question is what's going on right now? Yes. And what's going on right now is perfect breeding ground for cults because when, when a society is in turmoil, you know, which we are certainly um, on so many levels, uh, people are kind of at their wits end, you know, they're, they're, they, they, you know, on some day, I mean, even I felt some days I just feel like the damn world is falling apart. Right. So people are looking for, for, for answers, they're looking for a framework to grab onto. They're looking for someone who can explain to them what the hell is going on here. So, uh, you know, we saw this in Eastern Europe when the wall fell down and, and the various communist countries, you know, kind of crumbled and became other kinds of governments and all the cults like ran to Eastern Europe and they could recruit like crazy because suddenly that world was in upheaval. Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening here. So it's not just QAnon. I can assure you, and, and certainly we've seen this, the right-wing cults are growing, the white supremacist groups are growing, the left-wing groups certainly are recruiting now, um, you know, as kind of a counter to, to the other side. Um, the religious groups are growing because, you know, people often, you know, uh, go toward faith when, when they're unsettled. And so it's absolutely, you know, the perfect, you know, perfect environment for uh, cult recruiters to be out there just sweep, sweeping people up. Can you help me understand uh, how to know when a religious organization is a cult and also a political one? Because sure. so uh, there's so there's so many similarities. Yeah. So uh, you mean how a religious how a religious organization is not a cult? Yeah. How they're not a cult. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, here's here's my easy way that I try to describe it. If you're in a healthy religion, you are worshiping some kind of higher being or higher purpose, right? Mm -hmm. You're worshiping God or Allah or Buddha or a tree or you know whatever it might be, right? And the 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 pastor or person the who the rabbi whoever in front of you is not expecting you to worship them yeah. right and they're not controlling every single detail of your life right mm -hmm. so they may so that's one distinction um and then secondly 
you know, yes, religions will have guidelines and, you know, you might even call them rules, right? Mm -hmm. So the Catholic church says, don't use birth control, but they're not coming into your bedroom at night and checking if you're using birth control. Whereas right. in a cult, they're going to do that, or you're going to fear that they're going to do that, right? Got it. Mm -hmm. um, people spy on each other. They report on each other, right? They, so, so there are certainly some religions that are stricter and may appear more cult-like. Um, there are certain, some religions that started, started out as cults and that mainstreamed and, and became more, you know, got shed some of those more... Uh, those characteristics that were kind of against the social norms of, of whatever society they were in. So, so for me, that, that that's the big distinction. Um, okay. So and how are, about for, is, would the same apply for a political organization? Yeah. Well, for a political organization, um, I think for me, if a political organization has a philosophy or a, a, an ideology that says the ends justify the means, get the hell out <laughs> right yeah because yeah once, once you believe the ends justify the means that means you can be asked to do anything because oh it's for the greater good it's for the revolution it's for you know we becoming all white again in america right so when the ends justify the means they can ask you to kill they can ask you to rob cheat lie whatever it is right so that's that's one indicator right there and secondly, I think it's base, you know, basic things that we should do with any organization. How transparent is it, right? Where is the money going? Are you able to ask questions? And do your questions get answered? Or do they get turned back on you? Are you told, oh, well, you don't know enough yet. Take a few more courses, then ask mm -hmm. us that question. You know, right. And by the time you forget what the question was, right? Yeah. So, so all of that kind of, you know, are you able to criticize leadership? You know, is there dissent within the organization? All of those things, if everybody is a yes man or yes woman, you know, if everybody's kowtowing to some figure or some few figures, it's probably not a healthy political organization. Yeah, I'm remembering now a page on your website that has um, a list of questions to evaluate an organization or a leader. So I'll link to that in the show notes because I do think that's really important, especially now as people yeah. want to. I mean, the the good thing is people want to get involved and engaged socially and politically right. in this climate. But it, you know, you do need to be careful and go right. in with your eyes wide open. Right. Um, I always, I I always just say. If you're going to join something, think about like anything else you do in your life, like be a good consumer, right? You don't buy the first car you see, right? You check them out, you read consumer reports, you ask people who own that car, you know, yeah. so do the same thing with any other thing that you, that uh, some kind of organization or cause that you want to make a commitment to check it out like a good consumer, right? Read the criticisms, read the reports, go online, check out what former members are saying, you know, really do a deep evaluation before you sign your life away because you could literally be signing your life away. Yeah, no, I like that. Uh, based on your personal experience, has it been hard for you to attach to anything group oriented? Yes. Do you have a, a hesitation? Oh, I do. Yeah. I do. It took me forever to sign a petition because that was one of the ways we recruited in my group. We'd go around with petitions and then we'd save those signatures and follow up with those people and their addresses. Um, it took, it wasn't until the women's March two was it two years ago, three years, four years ago now? 2017. I think that was when he took off January. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. The inauguration, yeah. it would have been January, yeah. 2017. That was the first demonstration I went to. Uh, since 1980, since getting out of the cult in 1986. Wow. I, I couldn't go to demonstrations. I, I actually used to have very strong reactions to just sitting in a circle. Like if I went to a conference or something and they had breakouts and you had to sit in a circle, I would freak out. <laughs> wow. So yeah, sure. there, there are a lot of things that, that hang with you that, that set off what we call triggers. Um, you know, and I, and for me, you know, having been in a leftist group, I didn't want to be, you know, I, I, I had to reevaluate everything I wanted to believe in and I didn't want to become then a right winger, you know, so yeah, yeah. I had to really measure like what is wrong with this belief system that I tied myself to that, you know, without becoming, you know, completely rabid on the other side. So it, it's a long process going, you know, putting your life back together that way. Yeah, and this is why I'm sure you you try to connect people with with great therapists who are trained to help people in this PTSD post cult 
trauma. Right. Um, a great call to action for people studying psychology, maybe for a, a, a niche, you know, a specialty. Um, well, something I ask all my guests before they go is, uh, what is keeping you up at night? <laughs> what is keeping me up at night is um, the, the state of our country right now. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm deeply concerned. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the election and what kind of um, activities might come about after the election, after the numbers are counted, probably even before they're announced. Um, I think whichever side wins, I think there's going to be problems. I know. Um, And I mean, I don't think the Democratic side would start violence by any means, but I think... um, I think our country's in a very, very precarious situation right now um, between the election and the Supreme Court um, and the kind of the, the influence that uh, Trump has had on our society of kind of removing people from reality. Yeah. Um, that's what keeps me up at night. Yep. I'm right there with you. And also, I think that Women's March got a lot of people out there for the first time in a long time. That was like a call to action that a lot of women felt, okay, I'm done sitting back for whatever reason they weren't participating prior. Um, Well, Dr. Lalich, I so appreciate your time and insight and personal story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thanks for killing the small talk. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production edited by Jason Usry and produced and hosted by me, Rebecca Sebastian. Please be sure to subscribe to Dialogue, a true crime conversation, wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across all platforms. You can also drop me a note or a guest suggestion or sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Be sure to join me every Wednesday for a new episode and another killer conversation.